Hello, Global Gardeners, and welcome to another wonderful Gardening Monday. We're going to spend the next 90 minutes talking a lot about what's happening in our gardens right now, answering your questions. I'll be talking about shade cloth, when it's time to throw in the towel on some of your plants, and I'll course have some philosophy at the end. Let's go ahead and start. There's been some discussion going back and forth already with Scott Mackley wondering about Asian beetles and what we can do about them. Now right off the bat if you look up Asian beetles you'll probably find Asian lady beetle which looks a lot like a ladybug. It's a little bit bigger. They're a predator in the garden so if you see Asian lady beetles, chances are they're hunting down aphids and other uh, soft-bodied insects in your garden, but they can become a nuisance. They can smell bad, they can get in your house, and a trap is the most effective way to try to get rid of the Asian lady beetles, to include vacuuming them up if they come in the house. If they're outside, Keeping them under control is actually a pretty good idea because they can run out native ladybug populations. But if, as it <coughs> excuse me, if it sounds like they're eating your plants, then it's not an Asian lady beetle. It might be something like a harlequin bug, which is often identified as an Asian beetle. And I've had that problem before with the harlequin bugs. Trapping can be quite effective, but with those kind of beetles that eat your plants, it's best, I think, to try to disrupt their life cycle. And so if it is a harlequin bug or something similar, you can look for their eggs. They have little black and white barrel-shaped eggs that they'll lay in rows on the leaves. And they'll overwinter in leaves and branch piles. And that's how you control those type of insects is you clean up your garden in the fall. Now, a lot of us, myself included, will do some cleanup in fall and the major cleanup in spring because I am intentionally keeping some of those protected areas, some of those piles for the overwintering beneficial insects. That's the problem. Some of these same areas that are being used by beneficial insects are also being used by some of these nuisance or pest insects. So when you identify specifically what it is you have, like a harlequin bug, then you can clean up your garden in the fall, look for those kind of eggs, and that can drastically reduce their population. But you'll probably still have to handpick them. You'll have to put traps out and it may take a while. I had harlequin bugs at the Galileo Garden a number of years ago, and I remember one three-day period where we had students out in the garden spending an hour a day pulling off the harlequin bugs from the, the plants, and it was the turnip plants that they loved that year. They infested a number of different beds of the turnip plants that we had. And we got bags and bags and bags of the harlequin beetles that we were just plucking off the plants and then throwing them in the freezer so we could look at them later as part of a, a school activity, a science activity. And so you're going to be trapping and picking off, but over time, what we ended up doing was bringing in some of the predators of, of the beetles, encouraging birds, keeping up with the hand picking, but by cleaning up the garden, by the third year, we didn't have a harlequin beetle to be seen anywhere. So it may take time to get control over a pest like that in your garden, but it is well worth the effort because then once that pest is gone, you can keep the piles and you can keep the, the leaves for the beneficial insects to overwinter. So there you have the first question of the day. Great to see everybody here. Good morning, Jen Page in Ontario, Canada. Sharon Stock in Smoky, Wyoming. For the first time, finally, uh, day before yesterday, I could see the mountains from my house. Normally I can see them every day. We've had so much smoke. Yesterday was our first smoke-free day that we've had in a couple weeks. So I hope the smoke clears out for you soon because it was amazing to actually have a day without smoke. The wildfires 
in the western U.S. have just been crazy this year. So let's hope that they they cease and don't grow and give us more smoke-free bays. Uh, Jay is saying, mine are the Japanese beetle. It's a species of scarab beetle. Okay, 15 millimeters in length, 10 millimeters in width has iridescent copper colored elytra and green thorax head. And so that's that's a, a good thing to point out just as I was talking about. When you can identify specifically what type of pest you have, then you can find specific controls for those pests. And there's just so much information online to, to get that kind of information out there. Good morning, painting Tracy from Illinois. Gary Norcal is a Again, with us from Northern California, lots of heat. Um, I have a daughter in Portland, Oregon, I've mentioned. There are three or triple digit temperatures again this year, setting records. So it's just, it's just absolutely crazy. Hi, Kevin. Good to see you. I thought I saw some lightning bugs in my garden last night, but I just stood up too fast. Oh, I love lightning bugs. We don't have those here in Colorado, or at least my part of Colorado, but I'm envious of you. I, I, have driven through Iowa and Minnesota and Georgia and Tennessee and had uh, lightning bugs at night. It's just a fantastic sight. I wish I wish I could have that. So I'm envious of you being able to get that. Taco Promotions is saying my major pest issues are possums, a green caterpillar that eats my squash plants and aphids. And so um, aphids are, are relatively easy control with sprays of water and encouraging the beneficial insects to come in. The caterpillars, we were just talking last week about BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, is, is a natural bacteria that you can put on your plants. It's very effective for caterpillars. But as do the possums, uh, I don't have a solution there. It's another animal that we don't have a lot of in my area. So if you've got possum controls, throw them out today and we'll see what we get from that. And I want to give condolences to Libby, who had mentioned earlier that a storm came through and tore up the tomatoes and the aubergine and the peppers. And uh, I, I had that happen almost this time last year, a little bit later. I did a video about it last year about dealing with severe damage in the garden. And so it sounds like you might have the right idea, which is just get back on the horse and start gardening again. And you should still have some time in the season to get some more plants in the ground and at least maybe see some fruits of your labor. But I had a hailstorm that devastated everything in my garden last year. Already this year, I've harvested more fruit than I harvested all of last year because Knock on wood, I said this before, I haven't had a hailstorm that came through. I've spent a lot of time and effort and money to cover most areas of my garden with hail cloth this year. And of course, that means no hail comes. So that might be the solution is prepare your garden for a major storm. And if you're lucky, that major storm won't come because you've already prepared for it. But if it does come, then you're ready. So sorry to hear that you've lost your garden. There, there was one year... Uh, I lived close to where I live now in an area called Black Forest. Lots of trees, uh, lots of land. I was just starting a brand new garden. And in that first full gardening season, after I had the beds prepared and I had a fence around it to keep the deer out, I had to plant my garden three times. I planted in early June, which is when I normally put my tomatoes and peppers out. And two days later, literally two days after I put those plants in, a hailstorm came and wiped everything out. It was it was plants pummeled to the ground. And so then I went and bought a whole new selection of tomatoes and peppers and a few others, put those in the ground the end of the first week of June. And three days later, had a hailstorm come through and wipe everything out. And I almost gave up and then thought, nope, three's a charm went, bought a whole nother series of plants, started putting up some hoops and protection, and of course, didn't get a devastating hailstorm after that, and I was able to get a harvest. Not as big a harvest because it ended up about two to three weeks later than normal if those first plants had taken, but that's what you got to do sometimes is just to get back in there, keep planting. And we'll be talking a lot about that today as we move forward. Some of those thoughts about when to give up 
when things go wrong in the garden or just during the natural cycle of your season. At what point do you pull your plants? At what point do you put new plants in? When do you pull your shade cloth? Those are the kind of things we're going to be talking about today. But let's go ahead and see if there's anything else that's popped up that I should probably take care of right now. Ultimate Gardening is with us today. Hello, Ultimate Gardening. Always nice to see you here. Uh, Libby says, I'm moving into autumn plant mode now. Good for you. Over the span of this week, I'll plant things that were growing in the basement outside. And there you have it. If your garden is devastated, do exactly what Libby is doing. Be ready to put those other plants in. And, it, you know, maybe you weren't ready for your autumn garden quite yet. Well, now's the time to get into it. So uh, the the topic for the day that, that I'm focusing on actually came from a question that MB Gardener B had asked last week about pulling pumpkins out. And uh, they live near me in the Denver, Colorado area, and they're not getting any pumpkins on their vines this year. And the question was, basically, I'm thinking about pulling them out. Should I? Well, I, <laughs> I, I, I had some giant pumpkin seeds that were given me by by one of the viewers. I started them indoors because they take a long time to grow. I had a big delay in my season this year because the weather was just too cold too long. I had to wait for the soil temperature to warm up. I finally got those giant pumpkin plants in the ground in the second week of June. I put them in a nice area with good soil. They're protected with hail cloth just in case we, the hail did come and I still don't have any pumpkins. I should have had pumpkins at least a month ago if I expected to get anything close to a giant pumpkin. And I've got the first one that started to form this last week, a female flower, but it dropped off. So it either didn't get pollinated or more likely our high temperatures were such that the flower didn't pollinate. And so I've got this designated area in, in my new enclosed garden bed, and it's about 15 feet by 15 feet dedicated to two pumpkin plants, and I still don't have pumpkins. I'm pulling them. I, have to, I, I, I don't have to. I could try to keep them growing, but in my shorter growing season, there just isn't enough time for those pumpkins to develop. On the other side of my garden, where I'm growing in my Hugo culture bed, I already have, oh, I think three jack-o'-lantern pumpkins that are, I think the smallest one is the size of a softball. And I always have, a, uh, I have another one that's probably already about this big. I have some sugar pumpkins that are also uh, pretty good size. And this other section with supposed giant pumpkins, nothing. So at some point, you got to throw in the towel. You got to say, should I continue wasting my effort because I'm not going to get to harvest? Do I continue growing these plants so that I can learn about how these plants grow, knowing I won't get a harvest? Or do I pull the plants and start looking to the next crop? And so in that particular bed, I'm going to go ahead and pull those pumpkin plants, throw them on my compost pile, Go ahead and amend that soil now. I probably won't plant anything in that area going into the autumn because I have plenty of other beds where I'm growing some things. So I think I'm just going to focus on getting that soil to the best condition it can be for next year and, and put it to rest for the winter. And so it's a tough decision when you have actively growing plants to kill them, to pull them, to cut them, to do whatever it takes to, to stop them from growing. That is a painful decision for we gardeners, but sometimes you just have to do it. Now in other areas, it might make sense. And so I'm doing this in the, the bed that I, I showed recently where I just let it all go to seed. I'm going to give it maybe another week because I've already started harvesting some of those seeds and I've got enough. And this is the same discussion. If you're growing plants to save seeds, at what point do you have enough seeds? Do you really need 5,000 lettuce seeds? Or will you be content with two or 300 lettuce seeds? 
And so if you've got a bed like I do that's gone to seed, it reaches a point where I just don't need all of those seeds. So I'll collect what I want to save and then pull those plants and be done with it for the season. That bed in particular is the bed that I'll be growing garlic in for next year. And so this is a big reason why it makes sense to go ahead and pull the plants that aren't going to be harvested or have already produced seeds or you're just not happy with. Go ahead and pull them and now you can start looking for those plants that are going to be growing over the winter like onions or garlic or some of those root vegetables if you live in an area where you don't get really harsh winters you can be pulling your plants right now go ahead and amend them with some compost give them a few weeks for the soil organisms to to enliven with all that fresh food you just gave them with compost and then put in those late season plants so this week i'm going to be pulling up all those seed plants adding compost letting that bed rest for about a month because it's a little more than a month that i'll be starting my garlic now when it comes time to start the garlic that bed has been prepared and i'm not playing catch up and i can help give myself a really good garlic harvest you can do the same thing if you want to grow onions for instance or leeks some of those plants that do very well if you grow them over the course of the winter start thinking about preparing those beds now and those beds may be the beds that you have active plants growing in and so it's it's a tough decision uh, cucumbers are one of the easier decisions i think and uh, we had some comments about that last week as well when your cucumbers really start to fade and in my case i, I noticed that it often correlates to the arrival of of diseases or pests that start attacking your plants and that's because the plants are getting weakened and so if you start seeing those kind of issues with your plants that plants were nice and healthy and they produ were producing but something like powdery mildew starts setting in well that might be an indication that it's time to pull the plant because the plant is either getting at the end of its life cycle or it's been weakened by a pest or by the weather rather than struggling with a struggling plant that you're trying to keep alive to get that last little harvest well just go ahead and pull up the plants start over amend the beds and either put them to rest for the winter or get them ready for a whole new series of crops and so too often we want to make it difficult on ourselves without even realizing that we're doing it because we want to keep the plants growing well time comes when the plant doesn't need to keep growing and you're the one to help make that decision and move forward with the rest of the plants that you can grow effectively in that particular space okay let's see um, thriving in amber says finally got some green onions growing that's awesome and depending on whether they're um, uh, a bulbing I've, I've had really good luck with some green onions that were bulbing uh, or I should say bunching onions and overwintered them just left them in the ground in the fall and then in the spring got um, some just wonderful wonderful harvest so good for you that's that's awesome thrive they also say we leave garlic in the ground all year and they grow how they want naturally that's that's a nice approach as well and when you do something like that i like that idea where some of the plants that we think of as planting at a particular time and harvesting at a particular time if you just let them grow at different times, plant them at different times. You'll see amazing different or amazing results that are different than you expect. And so I've got a, a good gardening buddy, Jason, that plants garlic in early spring, knowing he's not going to get the big bulb of garlic. The bulb develops in the cold temperatures of winter. If you plant garlic in spring and it's not going to be exposed to those really cold soil temperatures, you're not going to get a big bulb. But what you're going to get is a wonderful garlic, a, a spring garlic 
is what he refers to it as. And it's a more subtle flavor. It's a lot more like a green onion. And so think about that. If you've got extra garlic cloves, uh, particularly in the springtime, go ahead and grow them and treat them like a green onion and harvest the leaves and harvest the, the small um, bulb that will develop and use it in your cooking as a more subtle garlic uh, or like, you can use it just like you would a green onion, but it's got a garlic flavor instead of a green onion flavor. So uh, there's all kinds of wonderful things like that that you can, you can try. Emily says, I finally got cup and saucer vine to grow after three attempts and it was doing great. Then about a month ago, the newest growth became to form. Should I pull it? Can I treat it? Um, good question. And so this is another one of those things. So, so not knowing exactly what the problem is, it could be herbicide damage. It could be heat damage. It could be caused by a particular type of pest. There are lots of things that can cause damage on plants. And most of us, those of us who have been parents and want to baby our children, we want to baby our plants in the same way. And when they get sick, we want to take care of them and bring them back to good health. Well, this falls into the topic of the day. At some point, you have to balance your efforts with your rewards. Because in this particular case, if the new growth is deformed, that usually is the sign of cellular damage, be it a pest or a disease or an herbicide contamination. And I did this last year, so, so don't feel bad. I do this all the time. I had a tomato plant, same issue. The new growth was deformed. I was trying to figure out what caused it. I couldn't figure it out. I suspected it was weather related because we had some really hot, strong, dry winds during the time that that new growth was emerging. And I think what happened was it got damaged by those hot, dry, strong winds and the plant never recovered. And even the, past that point, there really wasn't much new growth. And I waited till the end of the season, hoping that I would get that plant to recover and it never did. And so in this particular case, Emily, I don't know how you would treat it unless you can specifically identify what caused that problem and even then by treating it you might not get any continued growth from that particular plant so if you got a whole bunch of plants that are doing great and one's not doing well you can go ahead and pull out that one you don't have to pull out a whole bed and this is also part of of the 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 thought process when you have a plant that's not performing you might have a hole in the bed after you pull that plant. Well, especially if you're practicing square foot gardening, that just opens up a whole new space to put in new plants. And for those of us that are approaching the end of our season, that space will probably give us enough room and enough time to grow something like lettuce or radish or spinach and get a harvest or multiple harvests. And so in, in an area with like the cup and saucer vine, uh, I would say go ahead and um, pull that plant and maybe the other plants will fill in that hole and just consider it a lesson learned or keep trying to bring it back to life and then you can see the results of your labors and see if it was worth it or not. So I, like I said, I am often trying because I'm hoping that I'll learn something for the future where if I see that problem again, I'll be able to fix it. And rarely do I encounter the same type of issue that I can fix. So sometimes you just have to suck it up and pull it out. Laura's asking, how are your native wildflower plants doing? Any flower the first year? Yes, good question. So um, I, I just had such amazing success with the garden this year. Um, I had some Asian poppies. I, I showed them in, a, in one of my videos. They've just been doing great. Uh, the, the one that I just really love that's doing wonderful this year is a lemon bee balm. It's in flower right now. It's absolutely beautiful. My borage has done great. Uh, I, I've just had really good success. I've got um, cosmos that are in flower right now, and it's great. But 
my most satisfying part of that whole effort is I actually have black-eyed Susan, so Rudbeckia herda, that is flowering right now, and I've never had that happen before. It's it's a biennial plant. Typically, you won't get flowers until the second year. I started it from seed this year, put the plants in that that uh, flower garden, and I've already got the some blossoms this year. The plants are still relatively small. They should get much bigger next year. But it's just, it's so exciting. And I think, again, a lot of it is the weather. Our vegetables will bolt if it gets too hot. Our cool season vegetables will bolt when it gets too hot. And so some of these flowers, some of these biennial plants, uh, like carrots, for instance. I had car carrots that, that flowered this year as well. Normally, carrots are biennial. They won't flower until the second season. But if the plant is stressed in that first year, you can expect to see flowers. Now, the issue that I have particularly with this Rudbeckia is normally because they flower in the second season and then they start fading away, I don't know if these particular plants will come back next season. So this will be a lesson for me to see if its life cycle was disrupted by the heat and by, it was, by the fact that it flowered in its first year. It'll be a new lesson for me going into next year. But yeah, the, the garden is doing great. And I just saw some new flowers um, popped up in a whole different area on the other side. I've been focusing on one area that's by my raspberries and by my, my wildlife fountain. And then some of the flowers in or the seeds that I had started over underneath an apple tree. I, I see some seedlings that are just starting to emerge in that area now. And so... Uh, thanks for asking. It's it's just fascinating. I'll be doing a lot more um, in that area, adding more plants, adding more seed, and then expanding that area moving into the years ahead. But I've just been very, very happy with it in the first year. And, and it raises, you know, a good issue uh, when it comes to gardening. I was prepared for this. So I, I got that area prepared last year. I brought in some compost, very light compost just put it on the surface of my native soil. Then I covered that area with a wood chip mulch and let it sit for the winter and let some soil life develop. In, in late fall last year, I showed this in a video, I sowed some seeds in that area. And then I did some winter sowing of some seeds in that same area this year. And then I moved some plants in that I started from seed indoors into that area. And it's been interesting to see the, the phase of the plants. And so some of those plants that uh, or some of those seeds that I sowed last fall, well, those plants, part of their normal growth cycle, didn't start to emerge until early June. And so I was really surprised when some of those plants began to pop up, like California poppy, for instance, um, it didn't emerge until later than I would have suspected. And the uh, the poppies that I mentioned, those were one of the ones that I winter sowed. They popped up right away and have been uh, flower or flowered great. Now they're fading because their cycle is complete. And so it's really nice to prepare an area, put in a big variety of plants and then you can see how the normal growing cycle in a season works which plants will pop up first which ones will bloom first which ones don't show up till later which ones are the last ones to bloom and so i i just think of a a wild life and wild flower garden is is just a fascinating thing to observe i brought i saw some uh, hummingbirds recently uh, appear in my garden. So I put up a hummingbird feeder a couple weeks ago and they're coming to the hummingbird feeder with the sugar water. But, and this is the part I love the most, which is why I encourage these kind of gardens. The hummingbirds spend more time with the flowers in my garden than they do with the sugar water feeder in my garden. And so when you can give that diversity of food to the wildlife, not only is it wonderful to watch, but it's also better for the animals that are in your garden. So uh, I 
I'll, you'll be seeing a lot more on this in my videos because I just really love the success I've had with this flower garden and it's going to be expanding and growing even more. And I'm working some, uh, with some ideas. I'm working with a woodworker, Brian Benham, who has his own channel and he and I will be collaborating on a video later uh, in the fall. He's going to be making a, a lantern, a, a solar powered garden light that we're going to be putting in that area of the garden because I think I think it's nice to have some light at night in your garden because it you can walk through it and you see see things literally in a different light uh, and so he and I are going to be working together to put some lights in my garden to help highlight that particular garden area so a lot more to come but thanks for asking I think that's wonderful Brian's asking, is it better to completely ripen tomatoes on or off the vine? It's better to do it on the vine. Uh, and this holds true with pretty much um, all plants. Now, there are some fruits that if you pick them a little underripe and then allow them to ripen off the plant, they, they'll, they'll taste great and they actually will do better. But for the most part, if you can allow the fruit to ripen on the plant, you will see better results. It will taste better, it will look better, and it's also, uh, I think, more enjoyable to pull a ripe fruit off and then use it right away when it's freshly ripe than to pull something that is unripe. It'll still ripen indoors. You can, you can ripen green tomatoes indoors, but you never know for sure if they're fully ripe. They'll turn color. You may have seen this as well where you take green tomatoes, you bring them indoors, they turn color, and then you go to use them and they're still not fully ripe. So it does take longer and there's a lot more uncertainty when you ripen unripe fruit. But for tomatoes, go ahead and, and wait until they're on the vine. The same with peppers and melons and squashes and all the rest. They'll, they'll taste better if you can give them more time on the vine and let the plant just fill them with all that wonderful taste and nutrition. So um, so talking a little bit about that, that wildflower garden, let me go ahead and talk about my background today before I forget it. This comes from Pamela Corsi, and isn't this a beautiful garden? And this, I, I love this, she, uh, she sent me this, this photo of her garden, and this is exactly how I envision my garden to be. And I'm not there yet, it looks close to this, I have a number of these same flowers in my garden, uh, but I just love the rustic look of, of Pamela's garden with the wooden fence that surrounds this area and it's weathered wood. I love the look of weathered wood. And then the, the beautiful shed that's back here. It's just, uh, it's, I'm, I'm going to have my greenhouse in a similar location to uh, my garden like this, but I see that shed and it makes me want to build a shed that looks exactly like that because is that not the classic garden shed? And uh, so it's it's just a beautiful garden space. Uh, some good success. You can see also over my shoulder here, some cattle panel trellises. And she uh, mentioned to me how much success she's had with the cattle panel trellises. Also in this area, um, lower down, she has some um, lower trellised areas, but just lots of good garden plants. Uh, the, the, the vines that are growing up the trellis, growing all the typical stuff that, that you would grow. She gave me a long list of the beans and the peas and everything else. So everything that you're growing in your garden, she's growing in her garden, but this is all the part that I think is fantastic. Doing both in a a small area. So if you're limited by your garden space, don't think that you can only do a vegetable garden or you can only do a flower garden because you just don't have enough space to do both. You've got enough space space to do both. This is essentially Pamela's whole garden area and she's got a beautiful flower garden and she's got a beautiful vegetable garden. So go ahead and combine them. I I tend to separate out my gardens because I like I like the rooms of a, a landscape where you walk into different settings and you get different feelings, different exposure to the plants. But I've got the space to do that. If you don't have the space, 
do something like this where you create the, the wonderful shed with the grass just outside it and it's a fenced garden with a nice gate and you've got the flowers and you've got the vegetables and I, I have little doubt that all of us would love to just spend some time just walking through a garden like this and just sitting in a garden like this so shout out to Pamela thanks for sending me that photo of your garden and I'm I'm quite impressed this, I saw this and just uh, I have to show it to you because it just it, it really gave me a good feeling about the garden and the gardener and I wanted to share it with you and if you've got your garden that you would like to share with me it doesn't have to be in bloom like this I see good things of every garden that I see go ahead and send it to me at Gardener Scott at Gardener Scott .com, Gardener Scott at Gardener Scott .com, and that'll be one of those things that we can go ahead to uh, or I can show it to you in the future uh, and I think it'd be one of those things that if if I see something in your garden I will definitely point it out and share it with all the rest of us so we can get good ideas because we all have good ideas in our gardens we may not even realize what it is we're doing until someone else sees it and they realize it, they realize that it's a good idea so always nice to have you there Nevada Bills checking in good morning to you uh, Jim Wise, I was just thinking about this today. I was thinking about doing a video about alfalfa pellets. So Jim Wise is wondering, what do you think about adding alfalfa pellets to my soil? And so um, I think it's a great idea. Uh, alfalfa pellets are a great nitrogen source. They're loaded with nutrients. And this is a good example. And this is what I was thinking about today. So coincidentally, I really was trying to, to piece in my head a video that I might be doing in the weeks ahead that ties in with what we're talking about today. When you pull the plants from your bed, when you've got a bed that you're preparing for the next season in particular, alfalfa pellets can be a nice soil amendment. It's got its built-in nitrogen and it, it, they break down pretty quickly when they're exposed to moist conditions of the soil. But it's not something that would necessarily start growing in right away. Even though it has all that nitrogen, there still needs to be the, the soil microbes that roll in and start incorporating that nitrogen into the soil. And that takes a, a certain amount of time. And so it, as a fall or autumn amending of the soil, I think alfalfa pellets can be great if you've got a good source for them depending on where you live uh, it can be a, a uh, relatively expensive way to amend your soil you can get the same results by just using the the organic material that you have in your yard you can take grass fresh grass clippings when you mow your lawn and work them into the soil and essentially get the same benefits as you would from alfalfa pellets. And as long as you aren't treating your grass with herbicides, it's going to benefit your soil. Same basic time frame where it needs to be broken down by the soil organisms. Grass clippings are free. Alfalfa pellets, unless you can buy them in bulk or you have a really good source, are going to cost you. So alfalfa is great. A, quick, a good quick punch it also works great in a compost pile if you got a compost pile that's a lot of browns and low in nitrogen and needs a big boost alfalfa pellets can give your compost pile a big boost as well and so uh, look for a video about alfalfa pellets I'm still I'm still formulating it in my head I'll probably say a lot of what I just said but if you've got the alfalfa pellets go ahead and use them and uh, I bet you'll see some good results as a result Okay, let's see. Matt Venturini is checking in from Pennsylvania. Nice to have you here. Yeah, Rob's allotment channel. Alfalfa pellets are often used uh, for rabbits, uh, goats, a lot of uh, the domesticated animals that we might have in our homes. We feed them alfalfa pellets. And uh, that's where you're going to find them is at a feed store for those kind of animals and so uh, I had some neighbors a while back that raised hundreds of rabbits and so they had alfalfa pellets 
And if you if you can find somebody that's raising rabbits, the the rabbit droppings along with the alfalfa pellets that have fallen in the bottom of their cages and mixed and use that in your compost or as a soil amendment. Good nutrients, really good stuff. But that's where you're going to find alfalfa pellets. Uh, yeah, thriving in amber says gerbil food. There you go. Uh, Kevin says I use alfalfa pellets regularly because I don't have access to clean grass clippings. Horse feed is what it's sold as, and it's not expensive at TSC. I think that's tractor supply. So uh, look into it. It's one of those, you know, as as we talk about these things on Mondays and as we share these ideas, these are all the kind of things to to think about. Something new. If you're if you want to try something new in your garden next year, alfalfa pellets may be the solution. And so uh, you may love them. You may see zero results. It may be one of those things that you become an advocate for uh, alfalfa pellets or whatever it is from here on out. But uh, I'm glad we could talk about that. Uh, Daniel's wondering, have you grown tomatillo tomatoes before? So I've grown tomatillos and I've grown tomatoes. I'm not aware of a variety that's called tomatillo tomato, if that's what you're asking about. Um, but tomatillos, uh, we haven't talked a lot about tomatillos. I'm not growing them this year. I had planned to, and this is one of those things when you have as many seed packets as I do, and I was laying out all the seed packets and planning what I was going to grow for the season, and I started hundreds of plants this year. As I was moving my tomato seedlings and my pepper seedlings into the first transplanting into a bigger size pot underneath one of those trays was a seed packet of tomatillos and I just had so many seed packets that I was stacking trays on top of others obviously and a tray got stacked on top of a tomatillo seed packet and so I didn't start my tomatillos this year I'm gonna try to rectify that next year but I have grown tomatillos they do best if you grow at least two plants so tomatillo plants can actually get quite large. In the greenhouse at the Galileo Garden, my tomatillo plants were about 10 feet tall and I trellis them up uh, the twine just like I do with my cucumbers and my tomatoes. Uh, but they spread out quite a bit. They can actually get to be a big plant. You'll get some tomatillos if you have a single plant. If you've got two plants, you'll get a whole bunch of tomatillos. So if you grow tomatillos, definitely grow at least two plants. If you grow three plants, you're going to need a lot of space. And so plan for that uh, and and you'll see some great results. The ones I was going to grow are a purple tomatillo. In my area, and I don't know why, typically tomatillos are green, but I've had more success growing purple tomatillos than I have growing the green tomatillos. So a couple different options there. Definitely something that that you um, can add to your repertoire because there aren't a lot of people that are growing tomatillos. Uh, tomatillos are typically used in Mexican uh, cooking. And so the green tomatillo is usually made or made into a green sauce and it it's delicious. You can also use it in salsas but I find the it, it works better in like a green as a green chili sauce. So green chilies and tomatillos and garlic and onion mixed together. Oh, it's a wonderful sauce to serve on an enchilada or a burrito or any of that that you might be eating. So um, add tomatillos to your list for next year of new plants to try if you haven't done that before. Uh, Kevin says I have a ton of Aunt Molly's ground cherries. Guess I'll make some jam. And I think I mentioned this a couple months ago. My Aunt Molly ground cherries um, were also that seed packet that, that got buried and I didn't start them this year. So good for you. Make some jam. That was actually my intent uh, when I was going to do it. Colorado Bird Nerd says my tomatillos are almost four feet tall. First time growing them. Pretty flowers. Yeah, it is a beautiful plant. And um, when it starts, um, when those flowers start turning into fruit and it just gets covered, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting plant to grow because um, it, it has a husk 
and it, it's not too far removed from a ground cherry but it it looks like a little Chinese lantern and and I, I've grown the Chinese lantern flower before so they're very similar and so it has this 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 papery husk that grows around it and so it's hard to tell exactly when the fruit is ripe because it's covered by this husk well and then suddenly one day the fruit starts popping out of the husk and that's a good indication that it's getting close to harvest because it has swollen inside that husk and now it's starting to break out of it and that that papery husk will still be attached to the plant so you don't often see tomatillos in the supermarket but if you do they they often have this papery husk that's still attached to the fruit uh, from the base and usually at least halfway to two-thirds of the way up so I like growing tomatillos just because it's so different than a lot of the other plants and it can really teach you a lot about the differences of plants and what to look for when it comes time to harvest so uh, that's that's one of those kind of things. Skippy says, I have four purple tomatillos and they're six feet tall and took over their garden. There you go. See, big plants. They do get to be quite big. And so that's definitely something um, to look for. Jay says, when the husk gets transparent, harvest time. And then use the husk in potpourri. I didn't know that. I've always just added the husk to the compost pile and so I, I didn't even think that there might be a fragrance for a potpourri thanks Jay I'll have to I'll have to add that to my list of things to remember and so I'll, I'll uh, give a shout out to Heidi and Jay they're here every week helping us out as moderators and throwing out helpful and useful information as always so it's always nice to to see you all here Okay, let's see. Christine Kendrick is saying, discovered white mulberry seedling coming up in a pot of my apple tree. Easy to transplant in Zone 9, Arizona. Also, does white mulberry tree have lots of droppings? Um, I, I can't speak specifically to the white mulberry. Mulberries are notorious for being a messy tree, and I would think that it should do okay in Zone 9 but I, I can't speak specifically to to that tree uh, if you've got the space and if you've got the time i say go for it go ahead and transplant it you should be able to transplant it once you've got some really good uh, leaves developing uh, I, especially in arizona wait till it cools down wait a, a month or two uh, just so that you're not over stressing the, the young tree but i think it could be a fun thing to try if you've grown white mulberry go ahead and throw some info out at Christine, but that's not something that, that I can grow here in my Colorado 5B garden. But I have looked into it because I wanted to try to grow some mulberries here, but just haven't been able to find a good variety that would actually work. Lily says, the birds eat all my white mulberries before they hit the ground. Good. Another good reason to encourage the birds in your garden so you don't have to clean up in the garden. Monica says, work well in zones 5 to 10. I don't know about the white mulberries uh, yeah and I did try a mulberry at the school garden but it didn't make it through the winter and so uh, that's why I say I've been looking for a variety that might do well I don't know any gardeners in my area that grow mulberries just because they don't do well and, and I'd like to you know push the edge of the envelope I've said this before where you you identify those plants that you can't grow and then try to grow them well mulberries fall into that category for me so maybe one day i'll figure it out and i'll have a mulberry in my garden but uh, we'll just have to wait and see phil says hi all i mistakenly planted a punch of huckleberries this year between my other tomatoes just for fun they jut out everywhere like arms and legs from my other plants only one plant next year that's a good lesson with the huckleberries uh, and huckleberries are another one of those plants that are difficult to grow in my area. They prefer an acidic soil. And so I actually did start growing huckleberries at the school garden in a, in a bed I had developed with acidic soil. And uh, yeah, they're, they're fun to grow if you can get them off the ground and get them going. Uh, Scott says wild mulberries here and way messy. So I guess Scott doesn't have as many birds. But uh, if if you like mulberries, definitely go for it. Uh, Thriving in Amber says, purple mulberries stain your skin really well. 
that might be an advantage to getting the the white mulberries if you're going to do it uh, okay let's see what else we have popping up lp is wondering about the best time to harvest ground cherries and pick them early i think either yellow husk dry uh, but still on plant only one had fallen but the husk is green so uh you'll probably again the idea of ripening on the plant so you'll probably get better taste if you wait until they start emerging or, or growing through the husk and when that husk just starts to dry to dry um, you can harvest it when the, the husk is still green but they they won't necessarily ripen fully uh, as i understand it if you harvest them a little bit early so yeah let have some patience let them stay on the plant a little bit longer you can harvest them in waves because they'll probably be ripening in waves but uh, wait for the husks to dry out a little bit and you'll probably get better results for that uh, that's another one of those things that we can share the information back and forth the ground cherries it, it, as as i was looking into ground cherries years ago <clears throat> that's one of those plants that decades ago years and years ago ground cherries were much more popular in the united states and nowadays i don't know anyone that's growing ground cherries other than those of you that have already mentioned it none of the gardeners in my area grow ground cherries it's a tough plant to grow in my area because you do have to start it ahead of time and then you put it in the garden and our weather the hot dry conditions uh, are not best for the ground cherries i did have a very small harvest last year i was experimenting with just a couple plants the ant molly is what i grew last year and they did okay but i'm still looking for a better spot in my garden but try try ground cherries next year add that to your list along with tomatillos of, of the plants if we can all start growing more of these different kind of plants we can bring back some of these classic garden plants that we just don't see anymore and there was a reason people grew them in the past but i, I think the big reason why we don't do it now is because unless burpee is selling a packet of seeds we're not going to grow that plant too many gardeners just go to the store and see what's on the seed rack buy those seeds for the year and that's what they grow and so there are a lot of wonderful unique varieties that are being lost because we're not growing them and the only way you're going to find some of these these wonderful plants is to order seeds from a nursery online or if you're lucky enough maybe your nursery is stocking some of these unique heirloom varieties but i really encourage you to to start going outside your normal tomatoes and peppers and peas and beans and potatoes and lettuce and spinach and that's what you grow every year step outside your comfort zone and start growing some of these other cool plants and do things like discover that tomatillos take up a lot of space that's that's such a great lesson when you grow something for the first time and it grows totally differently than you expected you'll never forget that lesson never forget the lesson so uh try some new stuff and and you'll enjoy it yankee sister always good to see you here on mondays hello to you and your gardening family as well purchase strike beans to try thanks for the tip awesome i haven't grown strike beans um this year i'm growing rattlesnake beans i'm growing dragon tongue beans and i'm growing oh, i can't remember the name off the top of my head but it's a very unique variety that my gardener buddy larry shared me some uh, shared with me some of his seeds and he got them from someone who got them from someone and so it's a variety i can't even remember off the top of my head i'll, I'll probably show it in a video one of these days uh and and that's what we're doing we he's sharing these seeds with his gardener friends so that we can grow them so that we can share them and the plants are doing okay they're there i started them a little bit er, or a little bit late in my three sister garden so they're a little ways away from harvesting but i'm looking forward to uh, that new bean as well so good for you strike beans uh, always always nice to, to do something new and exciting and interesting and I will encourage seed savers exchange I'm glad you brought this up Scott um, I, I've actually recommended them in this last week a few times to different people if they ask me 
uh, uh, if I got a video about a particular plant or if they're growing a particular plant and they ask me for a recommendation on where to get seeds, almost always I say Seed Savers Exchange. The, the most recent question I got was about garlic and Seed Savers Exchange sells garlic. Now they've got a very limited selection of garlic. Uh, I, I think it's like only eight or nine varieties, but I've grown all with great success. And so Seed Savers Exchange is uh, an organization that is trying to save a lot of these classic seeds, a lot of these heirloom seeds, and then make them available to the rest of us. And so thanks, thanks for mentioning that, Scott, because if you're looking for some really cool, unique things to, to try, Seed Savers Exchange is a wonderful place to go. Now, I'd, I'll mention Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. Their website is rareseeds.com. <clears throat> they also have some very unique uh, seeds that you can get. The difference is that Baker Creek scours the world and they find seeds from everywhere and sell them their catalog. And I've tried Baker Creek seeds for years, had some good success, had some bad success. And a lot of times it's, it's a gamble because Baker Creek will get a seed from South America or Africa or wherever, and they haven't had it long enough to be able to, to give you really good recommendations on how to grow it. Seed Savers Exchange in the United States is getting the backstory on their seeds. They've got some really great partnerships with seed growers, and I've had much better success growing seeds from Seed Savers Exchange, these unique seeds than some of these exotic seeds that you might get someplace else. Okay, that was a lot of fun today. Lots of good stuff. Uh, I wanted to talk about um, shade cloth <clears throat> because this is another one of those things like when is it time to pull your shade cloth? I've had a lot of questions about this last week that I wasn't able to get to. Because kind of like we're talking about plants where you just wanna keep it going, you're, you're thinking that it serves a purpose, well, it gets back to why you had the shade cloth in the first place. And so you may have seen in my most recent videos, some of the shade cloth that I had over, or like the most, the one I just did about topping tomato plants. I had shade cloth over that bed through most of the summer when we were at 95 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, 35 Celsius. It was just so hot, I had shade cloth over those tomatoes. Well, we have cooled down uh not a lot but this week our temperatures and last week as well and next week to be expected are in the high 80s and so we're 88 31 celsius and i don't need the shade cloth anymore and those plants are growing out of the trellis so i went ahead and pulled the shade cloth i didn't need it anymore because i had it in place because of the heat and i was shading those tomatoes now, if I left it on, it would get in the way of those tomatoes growing through the trellis and getting tall. So, think about that. If you've got shade cloth for that purpose, to shade your plants and keep them from the intense sun, once temperatures start to drop, you don't need a shade cloth anymore. So pull it. Same thing in, in a different bed where I had the shade cloth to help cool some of my cool season plants like the lettuce and the spinach and the chard. Well, those plants have been harvested. They're starting to bolt. Their, their, their season is done. I pulled the shade cloth from that bed because I'm going to be harvesting or pulling those plants here very soon. I don't need the shade cloth anymore. But the new bed where I started seeds for my fall crop, I put the shade cloth on top of that bed. Uh, over those hoops on that bed because I want those seeds a little bit cooler to be shaded even from the temperatures that I've got. And so shade cloth is wonderful. It can serve on a number of different purposes like protecting from hail. That's another reason I put the shade cloth over those tomatoes just in case the hail hit. Another reason I put it over the lettuce just in case the hail hit. We're really getting to the end of our hail season here in Colorado, at least for me. So that threat is less. Another reason that it's okay for me to pull the shade cloth. So 
If you're using shade cloth, ask yourself, why are you using shade cloth? And once that reason is no longer necessary to cover the plants with shade cloth, then pull the shade cloth and either move it to another bed or fold it up, put it in your shed or garage for next year and everything will be good for then. So uh, don't, don't be too concerned. I know this is a, a, a big issue of all of us where we're doing something and, and we get a little fearful and I'll talk more about that as well, about what we're supposed to be doing. And so we'll leave plants in the ground longer than they need to be, or we'll leave shade cloth on longer than it needs to be, or we'll leave plastic over our plants longer than it needs to be. Think about the original intent, and that will help you with your decision as to moving forward and when you can end it. So you probably see my arm moving. Well, that's because I'm petting the new addition to my family. And you'll see her in an upcoming video. But I have a new garden buddy, uh, a young pup named Mala. And she's been nice and quiet in here lying with me. We're in the bonding phase right now. Uh, she was introduced to Lily yesterday. And Lily's the old lady who doesn't have a lot of energy. Now I've got this this one-year-old pup with a lot of energy. So uh, they, we had a lot of fun with the two of them. Uh, Mala wanted to play. Lily wasn't necessarily in the mood to play. And so you'll still see Lily in some of the videos, but my guess is you'll be seeing a lot more of Mala because she's been doing great following me around the garden in just the last couple days. She's a brand new addition to the garden. So uh, she's a sweet little pup, and I think you'll like her. And I've also already started filming some of the footage of my introduction to you of Mala. And so I'm looking forward to it. So she went back and is lying down and just needed that little bit of attention, I guess. So, uh, yeah, Heidi, thanks. Can't wait to see the addition to the family. I appreciate that. Uh, T. Hendricks is asking, can you please repeat the name of the Seed Exchange? So it's Seed Savers Exchange. And so Scott here has says he talks about the Seed Savers Garden, but the that site is actually there. You go Seed Savers Exchange, and um, I, I, I'm sure uh, my my guess is that you'll probably see it popping up here. Jay is usually pretty good about it. I think their website is SeedSavers.org, and so if one of you could go ahead and just pop up whatever that link is to the Seed Savers Exchange. That would be helpful. I just love them. Uh, and it's actually an organization that you can donate to to, to keep their efforts going. It's one of those things that um, I, I think it's, as, as seed companies go, for the most part, I think they're about the same. The, the quality of the seed is the same. It really doesn't matter where you get your seed from, you can expect your seed to grow. Uh, you can you can get the two dollar packet or you can get the five dollar packet and it's going to gr grow pretty much the same. But I like Seed Savers Exchange because they offer varieties you can't find anyplace else, and just because of their mission, just because of what they're doing. So uh, that's why I like to support them. Colorado Bird Nerd saying thanks for the advice on shade cloth. It's first year using it in my high mountain valley location. Saved my garden from hail was a godsend. I'm so glad for that and I. I know we've talked about that a lot in the past. It is one of those things that uh, when your garden is saved, uh, it is just such a wonderful seat feeling, especially for those of us in Colorado that have such devastating hail. Okay, let's see. Rob's allotment channel is saying, we just got a five-month-old Cavalier King Charles. Our 10-year-old is not very impressed with him. He's on some of my vids. Awesome. I'll have to look for those. Um, on, on your channel to, to see what you're doing. The, um, <clears throat> now, I don't know, you know, for those of you that, that watch James Prigioni and, on his channel, um, and Tuck is a big part of uh, many of his videos. I don't know about that. I, I'll have to see. So far, Mala's doing wonderful in the garden. I'm still uh, working with her because she likes to jump in the beds, especially she's 
She's a dark colored dog and so it has been hot and when we're outside she overheats pretty quickly and she's already recognized that my my tall trellis for my tomatoes uh, has a space inside of it that's nice and shaded. So she's wanting to jump up into the shade of some of my plants. So I'm working on that and I'll talk about that in a future video as well when you introduce a, a dog to your garden. But uh, we'll see how involved she wants to be in my future videos. And so uh, it's, I think it's always nice to uh, have an animal in the garden. And so Monica's asking Mala or Nala? It's Mala. You're right with the first one. M-A-L-A. -A. And uh, she she hasn't been trained. Her uh, I rescued her. Not a real rescue. Uh, my former neighbor called a couple days ago and said, are you still looking for a dog? And his granddaughter was moving and the dog had been in a, an apartment and didn't have a lot of outdoor exposure, not a lot of training. And I said, sure. And so I, I rescued from some friends a dog that had an uncertain future. And so uh, her name was different. And she didn't respond to that name because she had no training. But now it's Mala, M-A-L-A, -A, and it is Hawaiian for garden or gardener. And so that's that's how I came up with the name Mala and because she looks like a Mala to me, a nice, nice, sweet puppy and a nice calming influence. So uh, you'll see more of her. I'll I'll try to get that video up at some point and uh, you'll you'll see her in the days ahead. Heidi says, time to put some short bamboo stakes at the edge of your raised beds. Yeah, I, I actually uh, was thinking along those lines, and I do have some bamboo stakes. I also have some chicken wire that I thought I'd put up. Right now, I'm working on um, um, just the general training of what the garden is and the pathways, and then we'll move into some of the rest of it as to what is allowed and what isn't. Tammy says, one of my dogs has discovered he likes tomatoes. I had to tell him he can't pick his own a few times. And I had that issue... Uh, with, with my best garden buddy, Shaka, uh, a chocolate lab a number of years ago. And she kept picking the green tomatoes and then bringing them to me. And, you know, it's such a sweet dog. And I was bringing the green tomatoes. And it took me a while to figure out, but I finally drew the correlation that we used to play fetch with the green tennis ball. And so we'd be playing with the green tennis ball and the next day she'd bring me a green tomato and my guess is she'd be out in the garden would see the green tomato she didn't eat them she just pulled just pulled them off the plant and brought them to me and that was my clue that she wanted to play fetch whenever she brought me a green tomato i had to end up fencing off that part of the garden to uh, avoid that issue jean pierre nice to see you today I've always introduced my dog in the garden and he took uh, care of the rats and moles on 2nd of June. He died. And guess what? Since then, moles and rats are my nemesis. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, it's it's so hard to, to lose a special friend. So Jean-Pierre, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, but that is one of those issues. And that is one reason why I opted to go ahead and, and get a new uh, friend for the garden because I've been having a lot more issues with deer and Lily just doesn't run after <laughs> Lily Lily's funny because I've, I've you've all seen if you watched my videos you've seen the rabbits in the background of a lot of my videos and Lily will be out on the deck and I'll say get the rabbit and she'll just kind of take a step in that direction and then lie back down so she's old enough now that she's done chasing rabbits but I have no doubt Mala will. And so I wish you um, the best if you decide, Jean-Pierre, to, to add a new friend to your garden and, and help take care of the moles and the rats. But I'm sorry to hear that that has happened for you. And uh, Rafaelia says the same thing, rampant with vermin. So I don't have a lot of vermin. I've, I've mentioned before the cat, and, and I saw the cat the day before I got Mala, just a few days ago, I saw our neighborhood cat hunting in the garden. And that's been a big, um, a big reason why my my vole population and gopher population, I think, has has gone down. So death, death definitely makes a big difference. 
And Healing with Gardening says, My standard schnauzers are great rat chasers and mole catchers, but I'm constantly filling hunting holes. You know, and and the yesterday, I think it was, uh, I was exposing her to different noises and sounds, and I turned the lawnmower on, and she's doing a, a great job with uh, just being exposed to a lot of it. But after I mowed and uh, uncovered areas that had been covered with weeds and grass, she discovered a, a gopher hole and started digging. And so I had that thought too. That's one of those things. There's good digging and there's bad digging. So if I can keep her focused on digging at the gopher holes, then I'll be satisfied. But I have to try to make sure she doesn't dig in the garden. It's always a challenge. Always a challenge. Um, oh, Malala means plagiarism in Thriving in Amber's language. Uh, that's interesting. So uh, we'll just we'll just take off the last LA. It's Mala, and she'll do a wonderful job in my garden. I have no doubt. Lil Mac says I have a cocker spaniel and Chihuahua, and both love tomatoes and berries. Spaniel used to love cucumbers when he was a puppy. Now they both opt for zucchini. And I actually am training Mala using carrots. Uh, it's I. I I've done that with with all of my recent pets. It, the dogs is train them with carrots, and so it's amazing the the vegetables that that dogs prefer if if given the option. And uh, you have to be careful because again, when they discover that that's in your garden, they'll often go straight to the garden to get that that they can harvest on their own. So, I'm trying to avoid that, we'll see what happens. So such good topics. I, I love talking about animals and and the pumpkins in in the garden, and uh, and then like today's topic. And I, I wanted to point out, Mage Gray Wolf had mentioned before we started, uh, with was talking about okra and sweet potatoes getting to the end of the season, and uh, you know I'll, I'll throw that out. You've probably already figured it out based on our discussion, but but particularly plants like sweet potato and okra, they. They take a long time to grow. They like that nice hot season. Then when they're ready to harvest, you get some good harvest. But a, a, often those last few okra that are on the plant or those last few sweet potatoes, you you wait a long time to get a minimal harvest. And so you have to decide, is that space in your garden worth that extra time, or can you put it to a better use? So as you mentioned, if you're thinking about pulling your okra and sweet potato right now, I would say that's probably a reason enough to go ahead and pull it because you're you're probably telling yourself, wow, I'm putting a lot of effort into these plants and I just don't think I'm going to get that much from them. Great reason to go ahead and pull the plants Start amending the soil, put in a new crop, put it to rest for the winter, whatever the appropriate uh, action is for you. But if you're thinking that it's probably time to pull the plant, it's probably pl time to pull the plant. And it you have a choice as to whether you cut down the plant or pull the plant. I've mentioned in, in past live streams, a lot of it depends on the root system. And so a lot of times with lettuces and spinaches that have softer roots, I'll just go in and cut the plant and harvest the whole head and leave the root in the ground so that it adds some organic matter to the soil. It might actually regrow if there's enough time left in the season. But for the deeper rooted plants, tomatoes for instance, I'll pull the plant because those roots take a lot longer to break down. And when I do go to start seeds or put new transplants in, in a tomato bed that I just cut the plant, those roots always seem to be in the way. And they, they, they seem to hinder the root development of whatever it is I'm putting in the bed next. So the big, robust, deep-rooted, thick roots, I pull those at the time that is appropriate for them. But the softer, younger, shallow rooted plants, I'll often just cut those off and leave the root. So it's an option. But I do pull uh, some of those as well. Spinach does have to tend to have a more dense root than a lettuce. And so I'll often pull the spinach and throw the whole thing 
uh, my my compost pile uh, and the roots will eventually become compost but uh, something to think about when it's time to clean up a bed how you choose to do it whether you're going to leave some of that organic matter to add back into the soil its own nutrients or whether you pull it and add it to your compost so uh, Jay saying I will be at the pulling decision time for beans and peas soon. Yeah, and 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 good example peas and beans Have a life cycle. They'll do really well and then there comes a time When you notice no new flowers are appearing on the plant or maybe only one or two flowers are appearing on the plant Well when you get to the, the harvest and you start seeing that no new potential beans and peas are appearing it's time to start thinking about that point and when you have that last little harvest go ahead and pull the plant and you'll probably be satisfied with your decisions uh, Bettina saying cut off the peas bush beans will be done soon too yep absolutely and so uh, I, I as I mentioned in one of my recent videos <clears throat> am look, trying to get a second season on some of my peas and beans and so I did a late sowing and so I'm hoping the weather holds out for some of those to include that new variety that that I'm trying and uh, depending on how long your season is that's yet another reason to go ahead and pull if you're growing peas and beans and they're done and you've got enough time to grow peas and beans again go ahead and pull them and put in peas and beans you can put peas and beans in the same spot that you were growing peas and beans don't worry too much about rotating crops within a, a, a single season and then when that second sowing happens and you harvest now you can add compost and enrich the soil for next year but uh, it, I, I think and, and I'm really guilty of this I think I've missed out on a lot of late season harvests because I let the first season har our plants go too long and it didn't leave me enough time to get that second harvest that second crop and uh, it's hard it's hard pulling plants that are alive but like that shirt that you've seen me wear in a couple videos says I kill plants so that others can thrive and that's the whole point to this is killing plants intentionally so that others will thrive or that your soil life will thrive or that you have less to do in getting your garden ready for winter or ready again for springtime so just just think about that take a good hard look at your garden this week and try to do that analysis and start thinking okay what can I do without and if I pull it what will I do with that space and I bet you'll be surprised by some of what you what you dis discover and what you decide to do in, in the days ahead. So, uh, Patina saying peas are shooting out new growth. Do I let them grow on? Um, potentially, yeah. This is another one of those things. It's it's all part of the same analysis. If you pull them all, do you have a better use for that space? If you have a better use for that space, then go ahead and pull them. But this is another wonderf wonderful lesson to see how peas grow that that new growth will continue growing you'll probably see that the harvest will be less than you got in the main plant to begin with but uh, give it some give it a, a little extra time so that you can see for yourself how your pea plants grow and then next year you'll be more educated when you see that new growth and you'll be able to tell yourself well oh, I let the plants grow, new growth, a couple flowers, a couple pea pods, wasn't worth my effort. Or you'll say, I really want to save pea seed as seed this year, but I harvested all my pea pods. Oh, now I've got some new growth. Let's see if I can get that new growth to give me some pods to save some seeds. And now that's the reason you're doing it, is for seed saving as opposed to harvesting to eat. So you have to bring in all of these reasons all of this the, the analysis and making your own decision so um, if you've got the space and the time and don't have a, a better option I say go ahead and let them grow and see what happens so Susan Baker's checking in don't worry about being late hello from Central Florida as always if you check in late you can watch it on replay or 
And then I do this when I when I watch live streams that I check in on late. You can just click back at the beginning underneath the, the video on the timeline. And while I'm still talking, I'll, I'll be here for another 11, 12, 13 minutes. But you can stay with us and just catch up from the beginning. And YouTube will let you watch the whole video right now from the beginning, even after I've signed off. So um, thanks for checking in, Susan. And uh, I appreciate you being here, even if it is late. It's no problem. Mage Grey Wolf is saying uh, I let the okra go to seed and uh, I'm still my okra's getting close hasn't flowered yet don't know if I'm gonna get any fruit on it but uh, I'm growing a purple okra I've said before I have a hard time growing okra but uh, we'll see what happens I'm just hoping our season's gonna be long enough that I can do it so um, Zarba fish Somerset is checking in from the UK I love all of my my gardening friends in the UK and as I said before there's so much about UK gardening channels that I just learned so much from and so thanks for being here thanks for checking in uh, such a wonderful group always nice to to have everybody here on Mondays I mentioned uh, briefly what I was going to uh, talk about today when we when we start talking about the philosophy phase extra things to think about as you move forward with your gardening and and i mentioned the idea of of fear and and what what might cause you some fear in the garden so that's what i want to talk about talk about the idea that there are things that we're doing or things that we see in our garden that that worry us or that we've heard about and i think that is really the situation that is is most damaging we hear that there's a potential problem. If we grow a plant, it's going to do some terrible thing, like mulberries, for instance. If we grow mulberries, it's just going to make a mess of our yard. It's going to destroy the grass. We're going to spend all our time cleaning up mulberries, and we're afraid that that's going to happen. And so we don't grow mulberries. It, it's so true, particularly when we talk about bees and wasps. We are so fearful of those insects that it can influence everything we do in the garden. And Lorian uh, is, is one of our, our loyal viewers and sent me some footage of bumblebees that, are grow, that have a, a hive underground in part of her yard and how she's making extra effort to not disturb the bumblebees. Now, of the, the hundreds of species of bees that you might encounter in the United States. There are dozens of species that are probably in your garden or in your uh, vicinity. And you may see a bee and recognize it as a bee, and you may see a bee and not recognize it as a bee. It might look like a fly. There are so many species of bees that are so beneficial that, that we don't even recognize that they're around us. But if you mention bees there are there are people that are fearful of that and i understand that there are people that are allergic to being stung and it can be life-threatening i fully understand that but because of that fear of being stung gardeners many gardeners avoid growing plants that might attract bees when i first started at the galileo school garden all those years ago I was told the story before I got there as they were discussing this school garden project and they wanted to get it off the ground and I was hired to build it. Well, they had a, a school night for the parents and the teachers to have input into this school garden project. And one of the parents said, I'm all for it. It's great. We need to get the kids out in the garden just don't grow any plants that have flowers because i don't think the school kids should be exposed to bees and of course the story was told to me as these are the parents some of the parents that we're dealing with have this mentality that you can't or that you should have a garden with no bees well hopefully you know by now that if we're growing a garden where we want fruit 
we often need pollinators and some of those pollinators are going to be. If all you ever want to do is avoid bees, then all you're ever gonna be able to grow are carrots and lettuce and spinach and beetroot and turnip. And you harvest all those plants before they go to flower and you can have a wonderful garden with no flowers in it and no pollinators. I like the flowers. I like a picture like this behind me that Pamela's garden is filled with flowers and you're going to get bees. So now learn about bees. If you have an inkling of a fear of something that might happen in your garden, learn more about it and that will help dissipate some of your fears. And so the teacher that I worked with, we partnered in the garden. She would teach the, the actual gardening lessons and I was in the garden to actually put it into practical use. And when the kids came out to the garden, I would show them whatever it was we were teaching. She was among the best I've ever seen, not only as a teacher, but in the garden, she taught the kids not to be fearful of anything in the garden, especially the bees. And by the end of the semester, all of those kids knew how to pet a bee. The bees that were on our plants, the kids used to love to just go up and just gently caress a bee while it was crawling over the flower. It's such a wonderful sight to see kids not afraid of bees and to be actually petting them as though they were a pet and something to be loved and welcomed in the garden. Isn't that a great idea? Well, we can do the same thing. Don't be fearful of bees. Don't be fearful of wasps. Now, sure, there are wasps that will sting you and it hurts, but often it's your fault. It's been my fault. Last time I got stung by a wasp, it was because I had a wasp nest in my shed. They hadn't bothered me at all, but because I had a wasp nest, I thought I should probably take care of this wasp nest so that I don't get stung. Well, I didn't get stung until I tried to take out that wasp nest because I riled them up, they got mad, they attacked. Up to that point, we had a nice relationship between me and the wasps. It wasn't until I became the antagonist, I became the one that was threatening them, that's when I got stung. And you're gonna see the same thing in your garden. If you aren't threatening these predatory insects, they're, they're not going to threaten you. Instead, they're going to do their job. They're going to attack the aphids. They're going to attack all those other insect pests you're trying to get rid of in the first place. And so be nice to the bees and the wasps. The bees are going to pollinate. The wasps are going to take care of your pests, and you'll be much happier as a result of it. And all across the spectrum, be it birds. I, I know people that are afraid to encourage birds in their garden because they're afraid that the bird is going to eat their fruit. Well, sure, that happens. You can take steps to mitigate that. Right now, I've got bird netting over all of my fruit trees because the deer came in and started eating the tips of my fruit trees. So I've got bird netting over them to help keep the deer away. Well, the reason bird netting is called bird netting is because it keeps the birds away too. So bring the birds in to eat those insect pests, you might lose a little bit of fruit, but don't be afraid to bring them in in the first place. Learn how to deal with them if that situation arises. That's the way I like to approach it. I like to have the healthy bio environment with everything working together, all of these insects, both the pests and the predators, the birds, the animals on the ground, sometimes they become a pest and sometimes we need to deal with them, but often there will be a natural way that those pests are dealt with, like the cat that we've talked about, my neighborhood cat that's been dealing with some of the vermin in the garden, or now my new buddy Mala that hopefully will help deal with it. So I don't have to re re resort to poisons or traps. I can just let nature work in instead of me working for some of those pests. And so um, look across your entire garden. What is it that, that you are hesitating to do? Or what is it that 
that you don't do as well as you would like because there's some underlying fear associated with it. And then see what you can do to overcome that fear. Often it's, it's the knowledge. Another great way to overcome some of the fear is to just confront it. If there's a particular uh, plant or insect or animal that causes you fear, confront it and do it slowly from a distance and then gradually work your way up just like the bees that we were talking about. The kids that were fearful of bees when they confronted that fear it started by just standing in the garden and observing that bees are flying around and they're not harming. It ended with them using their finger to stroke the back of a bee and then also see that they weren't being harmed. And so it, it takes some time. It is one of those things to work toward. Often it's an insect, often it's an animal, but it might be something else. I can't even begin to imagine what it is that might be within your own gardening realm that causes you some anxiety, some, some concern, maybe some fear and frustration. And I encourage you to confront it and try to work through it and try to learn from it. And it should make your gardening experience much more enjoyable. It, it, it keeps you more attuned to your garden. I, as, as, you, as you may remember from another video where I was talking about grass clippings, I keep grass clippings in my garden. I keep piles of grass clippings to dry out and use as mulch. A few years back in my last garden, I went to collect some of the grass clippings to spread on my garden. And what I didn't know is that there was a yellow jacket wasp nest in those grass clippings. I riled them up. Sure enough, I got a sting. It wasn't bad. I could have been stung worse, but it was one of those educational opportunities for me ever since then before I reach into a pile of grass clippings. I do one of two things. I'm either wearing leather gloves so that if there is a wasp nest there, I don't get stung, or I just kind of with my boot or a, a, a fork, garden fork, just ruffle the pile to make sure that there isn't a nest in it. I've learned from it. I'm not afraid of the wasps. I encourage the wasps to make nests in my garden. I'm just more attuned to the fact that they might be there because I'm encouraging them. And if they are there, I need to slow down some of my gardening actions so that I don't get stung. And that's that's the basis of, of the message I want to get across, is you may need to slow down a little bit. You may need to modify some of what you're doing, but don't be afraid to do it just because of a potential conflict. If you're allergic to bees, by all means, if you're out in the garden, you already know this. Carry your EpiPen and be ready for the, the potential consequences. But if you're gardening, you're going to be exposed to some of these issues and how you choose to confront them can make a difference between how happy a gardener you are and not. So there you have it. Some words to think about today. Colorado Bird Nerd, thank you so much for that contribution. I appreciate it. Thank you for another wonderful Monday morning garden talk. Oh, I appreciate you being here, as I do all of you. I appreciate my Monday garden talks as well. Not just the morning, because I know some of you are in Australia. Well, I guess it is early, early morning. And some of you are in the UK, where it's already getting in to be late afternoon. I just love spending all this time with you, and I'm glad that we could share some good information back and forth. I enjoyed today. I think we had some good things, and I look forward to introducing you to Mala in the days ahead. And I have little doubt that she's going to be a good garden companion, and of course, as young as she is for, for many years to come. So hope you have a great gardening week. I look forward to hearing some of your successes next week. And of course, I'll be here next week. I do want to give you a heads up that the first and second Monday in uh, September, I'm actually going to, actually, I guess, yes, the 7th. I think the 7th is that first Monday in September. And so right now, the 7th and the 14th, 
I'm going to be on a trip. I mentioned this before. I'm going to be going to a number of different uh, botanic gardens and city gardens and filming and documenting and trying to learn new things and discover some new plants. And so when I'm on that trip, I won't be here. So at least for the rest of August, I'll be here each Monday to include next week. Same time, same channel, same great gardening information. And so I hope to see you here. Have a great week and enjoy gardening.